All right, so if you guys are ready, we're going to keep talking about proteases here. Uh, remember, we talked about the general reason for reclassification, why that's changing. And then, as I mentioned, I want you guys to be comfortable with the key features that put a protease or any organism in a given supergroup. So think about it. What makes something go into supergroup excavata? If that doesn't pop in your head, flip, pause the video, flip back, look in your notes, or backtrack a couple slides. <clears throat> but what's the key feature there? Repetition is a key for this particular chapter, guys. You just keep going over and over it. Make flashcards, do whatever. What's the key feature for excavata? What's the key feature to go into the diplomats? Next one here. What's going to be the key feature for parabasolids? All right, so all of these guys... And let me write it out again. Oh, are part of supergroup. That's supposed to be the SG. Excavata. And now they're within a subcategory known as parabasolids. So when we look at parabasolids, what we want to look at is you know, where are these things found, what are these guys, you know, goods, bads, etc. Um, there's one variety that will actually oh, live in the gut of a termite. So termites, those little insects that chew up your house, or can, hopefully they don't, but they chew up wood. They eat the wood, goes into their digestive system, and then it gets digested and broken down by parabasolids. But crazy enough, it's not actually the parabasolid that digests the wood. It's the bacteria inside the parabasolid that is digesting the wood. Okay, so we talked about mutualism and endosymbiosis. Here's a crazy example. So this is supposed to be a termite. Give them some little antenna. So they're supposed to be legs. Okay, use your imagination. My drawings are not very good. But if you remember, that's all I'm caring about here. So, okay, so inside the termite, Digestive tract. The termite eats a piece of wood, goes into its mouth, and then that wood goes down into the digestive tract here. Within the digestive tract, you have this parabasolid living. That's the parabasolid. The wood goes into the parabasolid, the little cellulose particles, the fibers, goes in here. But now inside of that parabasolid is going to be bacteria. It's supposed to be little black dots here. Okay, The bacteria are what actually can digest cellulose and break it down. So the reason why I'm stringing this out and talking more about this, here's a scenario for you. You don't want termites eating your house. How do you prevent that? Do you put out a chemical that kills termites? Stops them from eating your house. But if you kill a termite, are you killing beneficial insects in the environment? Are you killing things that we want? Insects that are helpful? Or do we look at creating a chemical that kills a parabasolid? So now the termite doesn't die from the chemical, but the parabasolid is killed, destroyed, does whatever to the parabasolid. Now the termite literally starves to death. Or do you go after the bacteria inside of the termite? So those are the things I want you guys to think about. We have a three-prong approach. We can go after that, we can go after this, or we can go after this. What is the best one? And we need to think economically, you know, what's going to be the cheapest way to solve the problem but we also want to think about ecologically environmentally if i'm just spraying chemicals around my house 
what's going to happen to my kids, my dog, all the other beneficial insects. So things like this are what we need to be becoming more and more aware of and becoming more and more proactive on promoting. So just an example of parvisolids. Uh, the other one here, Trichinomus vaginalis, STDs. We don't want those at all. But if you try to treat this with a fungal medicine, no good. You just say it's viral. Eh, forget it. Can't do anything about it. There's a problem. So we have to identify diseases and understand what is the cause of the disease, what is causing the problems, and specifically treat that particular organism. Get rid of that organism. All right, so how do we identify a parabasolid? Well, they're members of supergroup excavata, so they have that key trait. You guys should be able to just spit out at this point because I've asked you so many times and you're sick of it, I'm sure. But once you're in excavata, to be in parabasolid, you need an undulating membrane. Looks kind of like a little fan or a sail wrapped around their body. They're gonna, oh, let me move it down here. They're gonna have flagella for movement and the parabasolids lack mitochondria. So those are the big three characteristics to become a member of this exclusive club known as the parabasolids. But you first have to get through the excavata criteria to then be able to move down to the parabasolid category. So, okay, so that's our second subcategory within the supergroup excavata. The third subcategory are the euglenozoas. These are supergroup excavata. That is terrible writing. It's supergroup excavata. Subcategory euglenozoa. Uh, it's based on the molecular data. These guys are the earliest eukaryotes to possess mitochondria. First ones that we believe evolved a mitochondria through endosymbiosis with a archaea or some bacteria that was a running cellular respiration or that type of process. And that, that organism basically became the mitochondria within the euglena or the euglenozoans. Uh, when we look across the spectrum of euglenozoa, it's, it's a pretty big, broad spectrum. There's actually two subcategories within euglenozoa that we're going to talk about here. Um, but what we're going to see, the euglenozoa in general, about a third, let me get this, about a third of these guys have chloroplasts. Oh, that was a typo. And are autotrophic. Others are going to be heterotrophic. We don't observe sexual reproduction within them. So no sex, asexual. They can exchange some genetics but we don't see male and female euglenozoas. And they're going to contain a thing known as a flexible pellicle. And I'll show you what this is with a picture, much easier than me trying to describe it. But these basically these little rods, structural rods, kind of like cartilage. So grab the tip of your nose and wiggle it. You got this structural cartilage in there, something comparable to that in the members of euglenozoa. So, all right, so now, again, I mentioned within euglenozoa, there's going to be a lot of diversity. Okay, so I'm going to draw the, do the little diagramming deal here. So we have excavata that branches down into three branches or three subcategories. We had the Diplomads, the parabasolids, and the euglenozoans. 
within euglenozoa, this is going to split down into two further subcategories known as euglenids and the kinetoplastids. So and that's what we're going to talk about, these two subcategories within euglenozoa. The defining feature to be euglenozoa that I want you guys to remember will be this one here, the pellicle, the chloroplast, heterotrophic, etc. That's going to vary based on subcategories, but pellicle, that's a big defining feature, as well as earliest eukaryotes to have a mitochondria. All right, so let's dive into euglenids first, and then we'll get into kinetoplastids. All right, now euglenids. Excavata, euglenozoa, euglenids. How do we know you're euglenid? You're going to have two flagella at your anterior end. I'll show you a better picture. The, the picture down here is a light micrograph of euglenids. They're tough to see because they're so small. You can see here's one flagella for sure. The other one is a very, very small reduced flagella. It's very difficult to see that second one, um, even with a big giant microscope. But there is a second one there, two flagella at the anterior end. Another big feature for euglenids, they're going to have a thing known as a stigma. This is a light sensing structure. So these guys can detect light levels. They cannot see. They can just detect light levels and move towards or away from the light. All right, now because they're moving towards and away from light, they are going to be photosynthetic. So they will contain chloroplasts, and the chloroplasts will contain the pigment chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. That way they absorb as much light wavelengths as possible. They are also known to contain different carotenoids. Those are your reds, your oranges, your yellows, your fall colors. So think back to photosynthesis here. Chloroplast absorbs solar energy, solar light. The pigment inside of it grabs the wavelengths and reflects back what it can't capture. So generally, euglenids look red. Uh, it's believed the chloroplast were obtained when they ate green algae and started work symbiotically, working together with green algae and now they have chloroplasts inside them. They do have mitochondria, so they can run both sources of energy production. I can be a producer and I can be a consumer. Uh, a significant fe feature or important fact about euglenids is that they're an indicator species. I want big double red star on this one here for you, okay? Indicator species are species that tell us water quality, ecological health. So if you've ever heard of the canary in the coal mine idea, you take a canary into the coal mine. If the bird dies, it means there's a poisonous gas in the mine. Get out. Today we use sensors to detect this. Euglenids are the canary in the coal mine for aquatic ecosystems. Go look at a pond, a lake, a river, a stream. You should have euglenids in there because they're photosynthesizers. They can be producers. And the concern is, let's keep it real simple. Here's a your graphing euglenid population. Let's say this is 2020. You go look at your pond, lake, river, stream, 2030. Oh, that's supposed to be a 30 and you're gonna watch this over the course of the next 10 years. And the population size, it's gonna always do this. It's gonna fluctuate. But if you see a trend that your population is going down, that's a big signal that you have a problem with your water quality. It is getting polluted and it is declining. Those guys tell us that. 
their presence or absence can tell us water quality and indicate good or bad water quality. So very, very important feature of the euglenids is that we can use them to indicate health of aquatic ecosystems. All right, I'm gonna pause it here. And then on the next part, we will wrap up supergroup excavata. We have the kinetoplastids. These are a subcategory of the euglenozoas. Okay, so check out the next part.